everybody. How's it going? Welcome back to the stream. It's Tuesday. We're getting tactical today. Um, we got a lot of stuff to talk about. Um, first off, uh, some housekeeping, I guess. I was live over the weekend, uh, as you probably caught, with the Midgard GT. Uh, we had some like absolutely nuts games uh, on stream over the weekend. So if you haven't checked out the VODs for that, already please go check those out really happy with how things came out um and i'm i'm trying to step up my level a little bit I, one thing i've i'm always i'm a little self-conscious of when i live stream is like my top camera's a little old so i'm i bought a bunch of cameras over the weekend and uh we're, i'm gonna be playing with them this week i'm gonna try to pick a pick a new top camera to, to use uh to make the streams better um for live streaming in the future and uh i will hopefully be be testing that out this weekend at the florida uh, ATC, American uh, Team Circuit. And so I'm going to be live over there. So please come check, hang out with me on Saturday and Sunday. It's a five-player team event. So if you enjoyed my team coverage of the 8TC, then um, we'll uh, be live with more of that style. Basically, it's going to be smaller teams, but there will be a lot of them and it's going to be good. So I'm going to be leaving on Thursday to go down to Florida to cover that. And um, I do have an event on the YouTube channel up for it, so that you should get redirected to it after this stream is over. <laughs> Thought it was common knowledge the tower second class citizens. Brutal, chat, brutal. I don't think that that's the case. Um, but so we also have some new uh, stuff from G-Dub to talk about. We got some previews of the new codexes, uh, orcs and adeptus custodies that I think we're gonna do it. We're gonna start out by talking about, but obviously, as the video title says, um, the thing I wanna, I just wanna comment on, and kind of an annoying thing that I feel like I have to caveat in every Monday video now when I do my best armies in 40k series. Um, it's hard to talk about Tau right now. Because we have their codex, we have copies of their whole codex, but it's not legal because it's not in the Munitorum Field Manual, uh, and it's not going to the Munitorum Field Manual anytime soon because it's not like actually available for public public purchase. It's only available in a uh, a set that is currently, and I bet I can take a look. It's currently not. It's out of stock. You can't buy it. Uh, it's the crude hunting pack set. Oh, let's go. And I looked this up this morning because I was like, when does the Tau Codex coming out? And the answer, as far as I could find, is no one knows because it's only currently in this current, this out of stock uh, thing that nobody can purchase. So what's up with that? That's stupid. <laughs> um, and this is exactly the same situation that we ran into with the uh, the Militarum Codex last year when Militarum were super dumb, super de duper dumb, and everyone knew it. I, I think obviously like the there's there's it's less of a power level issue with this new Tau Codex because it definitely feels like maybe maybe a side grade from the current Tau Index if the points values don't change. You get more detachments, but you lose some stuff and stuff is like not quite as exciting. Um, but it's this issue where, like, we know the relative power level of these codexes because people can play with them out of the gate, but they're not competitively legal for months. And Games Workshop is not going to make any changes to them, most likely, uh, unless they have different values in the field manual than they do in the codex, which I hope they do, um, for a month after they're released. So even if, right, all of the co the, the points values in the, in the codex are, are correct, which were kind of a travesty, uh, I think. They're, they're just like, stuff's getting nerfed. Stuff's getting upcharged for no real reason. Um, and it, it, it doesn't feel super strong. It, it, like, we won't get the opportunity to revisit that for like six to eight months from now, which is ludicrous. Uh, if they wait a couple months before before public release and then wait a couple more months to actually update it from there. Um, 
but like all that is to say that we don't actually know if that's the case because we you can't play with the codex yet <laughs> we don't know what the points values are so it's just stupid and it's just making me mad and i think like i don't know it, it's like is it worth talking about tau if we, like as we're talking about the 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 you know 40k metagame because they're playing with what is essentially outdated technology right now like i don't know and and i i wish it wasn't like that but that's just kind of the situation that we've been saddled with which is like super crappy friend got his standalone codex in the mail <laughs> yeah maybe maybe like stores can, are doing pre-orders or something and they and they they have like a, an embargo date or whatever but um, as far as I could find, there was no actual release date for the, the standalone codex. Um, unless he bought a, a codex like from someone who split the kit off or something like that. I don't know. It's very silly. <laughs> GW interviewed for codex writers, hired the person who hated Tao the most. That'd be tough. That's a tough interview process in the 40k community because, oh boy, are Tao the redheaded stepchildren. Points values are back to what they were at 10th edition launch and they had a 30% win rate. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, I think that's like, that's kind of the most damning thing, right? Is like clearly the, like the codex cycle, you know, is like at least six months out of date. Right. So because it takes this, uh, all this time to get the uh, book ready, get it to, to, to print, get it to publication. Um, and then, you know, ship it over, slow boat it over. It takes like a month in shipping probably between where they're print and, and actual distribution centers. Um, and then they have to get it to retailers. It's, it's, it's a huge, it's a huge dead zone in the middle. And you can't just use the, the, um, codex points values because the game has evolved since the point those were released. And we saw exactly the same thing happen to Tyranids, right? Tyranids released with, and then they released al almost, almost in concert with the edition, not quite, right? A couple of months later, um, but they released with different points values than when we were in the codex. And I think the same thing's gonna happen, but I don't know that that's gonna happen. You know, I, they did the same thing with Dark Angels, right? Where like they, they nerfed a bunch of Dark Angels stuff. And those are the two examples. On, on one hand, Tyranids, um tyranids they changed points values before the codex came out dark angels they didn't while also nerfing a ton of dark angel stuff uh which which kind of like made outside of lion's thorn made the faction like sort of just dead, dead on arrival um and i hope that that doesn't happen to tau because that would be a much bigger blow to the 40k community than just dark angels being kind of shitty um, you know, you can still play regular Space Marine stuff in Dark Angels, but you can't, <laughs> you can't do that with Tau. You're saddled with 130 point breachers and 80 point crude carnivore squads or whatever. Um, and yeah, I don't know. That's just frustrating to me. While I was making my video on Sunday, I was just like getting upset about it <laughs> because we're talking about Tau. Tau are doing pretty good right now, to be, to be honest. Uh, there's a bunch, there's like a couple different archetypes, right? You know, there's a vehicle focused archetypes. You, some some armies running lots of breachers and fire warriors some armies running lots of crisis battle suits some are all riptides some are all hammerheads it's like there's a there's a i'm not gonna say it's the most internally balanced index ever but there's a there are different varieties of things you can play and they're doing fairly well in terms of their representation they have you know lots of wins every week and and many x and one placements and it would suck if they just got nuked for no reason because their codex was bad like i don't um but i but i want i want to rip the band-aid off and, <laughs> and see what it's like you know uh we just can't do it and it's just making me upset and that's my rant for today chat that's my rant i wonder how fast they'll update the points for the codex yeah yeah i mean that's the other thing too right like just based entirely on 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 what we've seen in the past um, right, we, we we talked about Tyranids to be in tier, you know, getting getting nerfed before they released. Literally, uh, we talked about Dark Angels getting no changes before they released, even though their stats got tanked. Um, and then we also got Necrons and Admech, who got no changes whatsoever, even though they clearly needed changes after being released. Right, Admech was clearly difficult and 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 overcosted and necrons clearly had some undercosted units i'm not going to say the fact like the codex is like super boasted or anything but like 
Nightbringer, my guy, could bump that guy 30 points. He'd still be played. Um, and they just didn't do any of it. They were like, oh, no, no, we don't have enough data. Necrons won immediately after being released, but we don't have enough data. Okay, sure. Whatever you say. Points are not out, chat. That's the problem. That's what we're complaining about today. Uh, so, if, yeah. <laughs> Hefhoff, by the way, welcome to 40k. I hope you're... I hope you're having a, a wonderful time with the game so far, but uh, imagine being a new player in this in this mode. Oh, new Tau Codex came out? Oh, they're, I like them. They look like a cool faction. I'm gonna buy this box. I'm gonna take it to my local RTT next week. And then they show up with their Rampagers and the first opponent goes, my dude, they're not in the Munitorum. Can you take a dive and look at my boy Maelstrom Gaming Studios? He went undefeated at a team tournament with Tyranids. Hey. His team placed seventh overall. Um, yeah, just tell me what event that it, that's in. Uh, we will take a we'll take a look at that. We're gonna we're gonna run through the Warhammer community articles real quick first, and then we will dive into some lists. And we have a lot of lists to talk about today, by the way, uh, because uh, as I think as I mentioned on my Monday video, we had a lot of events that went more rounds than they could uh, than than they needed to for undefeated. So we had a lot of like undefeated players that I haven't talked about yet on the channel, which I'm excited about. So it's gonna be a good week, everybody. Data site and two new codecs is set to drop at the end of the month. Huge shakeup. Yeah, I'm excited. It's gonna be rad. I'm psyched. Guard players know the pain very well. Yeah. It's a different situation for guard, I think, too. Because guard was, like, really... Uh, unlike this Tau Codex. Unless somebody like, can prove me wrong. I think this Tau Codex, like I said, is, like, a side grade. Um, but guard was, like, super broken. <laughs> and that was that was a maybe even worse situation. Because the list was, was honed. Like, sometimes, you know, a Codex comes out and you're like, Oh, cool, new Codex. And then you're like, Oh, this stuff, this stuff seems really good. Oh, it, maybe it's too good. And then, like, you're, like, a month or two in. You're like, oh, yeah, it's broken. Oh, it's starting to take over the meta. And then they're just like, bam, change. And then it fixes it, right? And it, But that's like, a, that's, like, a two- or three-month process, usually. And Guard had that process complete by the time that their codex became legal. So everyone had the 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 finest point on their Astro Militarum lists, which were wildly overpowered in 9th edition uh, when they released. That was that was a miserable time for 40K for, like, for the couple months that that guard were competitively legal before being nerfed because oh my god you could not play against that faction unless you were you were ready to absolutely kill god uh because their kazakin would kill your entire army for uh, being 100 points mm -mm -mm. all right chat let's talk about some new stuff let's talk about some freaking custodies and some freaking um orcs we got new detachment rules. We got new custody stuff, and I want to I want to run through it real quick because I think it's rad. Um, I don't know if they talk about so there's six detachment for orcs, uh, and I don't know what they said for. I think they said four detachments for custodies. So get wrecked, custodies. Uh, yeah, four four new options yeah because they said shield host is basically a new detachment so it's four to four total so uh sorry custodies but i guess i mean that's a smaller codex it would be weird to like be able to to <laughs> find six unique archetypes in that i imagine there's only going to be one good detachment anyway to be fair um so but six detachments for orcs is a lot six is like a that's a space marine number right there which is kind of exciting and orcs do definitely they they start to rival Space Marine in terms of the depth of their codex, so uh, there's a lot there's a lot going on. Um, the green tie detachment kind of this is a little bit of a weird uh, detachment benefit. It gives you a five plus invulnerable save with boys, but that's not that's just what you get from having the Wa right. So it's it's kind of like anti synergistic with the Wa because you already have a five up invulnerable save it's kind of weird that it doesn't improve if you are under the effects of the law but maybe that was too strong or something like having a four plus invulnerable save or something or like re-rolling your invulnerable saves i don't know i guess you already get that um mm -mm -mm -mm. 
there's a thing that gives you extra strength, which is good, I guess. It gets you to strength 13 if you're in a big unit, which you probably are because you're you're putting it on a war boss inside a big boys mob, which um, gets you to wound T12 vehicles on threes, which is like kind of kind of legit to be honest. <laughs> Thanks for the super chat, Ryan. <laughs> Text to speech never change, my guy. Um All right. Uh come on, lads. Gives you D3 plus 2 returned models to a boys unit. I'm interested I, I guess it, this is probably only going to be boys mobs, right? But I'm interested if they, like, change it to the keywording to also work on Beast Snaga boys. That would be cool. It's a little bit weird if it's just, like, an entire detachment based around a single unit. Although it is, like, their backline unit. Their, or their, their backbone unit. So it makes sense. Um... Mm -mm -mm. You extend your engagement range to three inches when you fight. That's pretty cool. Gets you more guys in. Uh, which I guess is actually pretty transformative because that is one downside of the boy squad is a lot of times if you're doing like weird combat movement, if you watched the finals game on um, on Sunday uh, that I streamed, there was a lot of like insane combat movement happening. And uh, the downside is that it shrunk the amount of attacks you got to the point that it became like very swingy. Uh, and having being able to just be like windmill slam of CP down and attack with half your unit is like pretty cool, even if you're doing like weird pilot and consolidate garbage. Um, mm -mm. Dread Mobs lets you roll a d6 and get a random effect, or take hazardous to get the effect automatically. And if you're already hazardous, it doubles how often it triggers. It kind of feels like it's a it's a more impactful version of uh or i don't want to say more impactful it's like it's like a fixed version of the stupid um dark pacts right this is probably what dark pacts should have been you know instead of like oh it's it's binary on or off but you always get to choose what it is but the the chances of you taking any damage from it are are astronomically low. And even if you do, you probably heal or whatever. If you give everybody's weapons hazardous, that's a that's a terrifying a terrifying um, prospect for a big unit of Chaos Space Marines. Uh, bigger shells, you get to get plus one to wound and push it for hazardous and plus one damage, which then improves the hazardous if you also choose uh, a special critical effect. My hope would be that there is a way to um, get reroll, hit rerolls here, because that's kind of what like pushed those critical hit effects like to, to their to their extreme. Is if you can get you know lethal or sustained or whatever, but then also wound re or hit rerolls. And if you could do that, if you could get rerolls on like a sustaining unit of like um, killa cans with like plus one to wound, plus one damage, like suddenly that's a big deal. I imagine that there won't be, <laughs> but it would be cool if there was like a if there was like an enhancement that gave like a mech the ability to point hit rerolls at somebody or something. I think that would be what I would like to see in that detachment. Uh, if it's just a bunch of stuff where you're like, hey, try to roll some sixes, I feel like it's not really going to be that great, but I might be wrong. Um, the theme is on point though. Being like the hazardous matters detachment is kind of sweet. Oh, that would be a cool detachment for orcs, too. It's like you give yourself a bunch of hazardous, but when you fail hazardous checks, you do damage to people or something. That'd be kind of sweet. Uh, Cult of Speed gives you a 4 plus of vulnerable state by going fast. So you probably get to get a little bit of a... It's a little raven wing flavor going on. Bully boys uh, buffs knobs and gives them extra waz just for themselves. Oh, jeez. You get, like... Um, that sounds like you're going to get wah banners for, like, your entire army. That is real good. <laughs> I'm excited about that. Oh, my God. Holy crap. 
That seems just amazing. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Kind of odd that only one unit has the boys keyword. Yeah, I would love to see Beast Snagas get the boys keyword, right? Like the Beast Snaga boys, because they're literally called boys, and it would be interesting if it was if there was more than one. Um, but I mean, it's probably fine if you can make a detachment out of taking like sixty boys or whatever. It's like probably pretty good, because like that's already a pretty effective archetype. Read the bulldozer strategy from again. I teach each time the unit is selected to fight. Yeah, that's just like boilerplate templating. It could be that you get a fight on a fight again. I would be shocked if they reintroduced fight agains. Um, but that's each time is uh, is basically how they say stuff. Because like you know. This also says, like, each time you fight, right? Um, it doesn't say when or whatever. Once per turn when you fight. Um, I, I would I would be surprised if they, uh, if they returned the uh, fight again stuff. <clears throat> Having buggy nightmares from 9th edition? Yeah, let's hope that they, they don't return that horrible that horrible thing oh oh boy all right new shield host stuff let's go um the talons of the emperor detachment gives you the revered companions role so first of all i i like the idea of this of this uh of the this detachment right um also i i posted this on twitter earlier but this this uh this like splash art for the detachments like super jank <laughs> it's uh I appreciate it. I don't think it was meant to be blown up to high res. It's probably like a little thing in the corner of a page somewhere and they just decided to use it, but it, it is not the best. Off topic, I apologize, but LGS still argues demons being able to pick up put down turn one. Didn't GW rule on this somewhere? In TT we trust. Uh, yeah, GW ruled on it and, um, and the Leviathan packet also, I believe specifies that you can do it. Uh, I'd have to double check. It's so the the essentially the rule is that if you are uh, repositioned or redeployed into reserve in the first battle round, you're allowed to come on, assuming that you started the game on the table. Um, so you can't you can't come on from reserve first battle round unless you have a special ability. But uh, if you began the game on the table, you don't have that restriction. Um, I it might be called out in the tournament campaign or in the. Leviathan game document. Let me just look real quick. Um, yeah, so... Um, reserve units cannot arrive during the first battle round. Okay. Um, and you die at the end of the third battle round. This does not apply to units that are placed in a strategic reserve after the first battle round. Um, yeah, so there you go. Uh, so if you are placed into strategic reserve after the game begins, then this doesn't apply to you. But uh, otherwise, you are prevented from coming in first round. Uh, it's also in the... I believe it's in the World Championships of Warhammer FAQ that they released. And it's like... I think it's like implied in the rules commentary, but I don't know if they necessarily say it, say it out loud. But basically, the only restrictions from coming in per first battle round are if you're a strategic reserve, full stop, you can never come in first battle round. Um, or if you are reserving any other way and you started the game on the table, then you're good to go. Um, yeah, it's not necessarily deep strike. It just has to not be strategic reserves. That's an important clarification to make. So, like, you can't... If you are a strategic reserve, the core rules prevent you from coming in first battle round, full stop. Um, if you are using any other ability to reserve, then you're a, then the core rules don't prevent you. Only the, the Leviathan or uh, Crusade rules prevent you from coming in first battle round. And those get superseded. And those only apply if you started in the battle formation step. Um, so if you deep strike or you, uh, use like 
one of the weird like pseudo deep strikes like teleport assault is is like you do a deep strike but it doesn't say that you deep strike those are a-okay to come in first battle round it's the stuff like hyper crypt legion or guerrilla tactics that says you enter strategic reserve that you can't come back in first battle round that's how that works um, I have all video on reserves. You can you can play the video for the whole LGS and then <laughs> and then you'll be good to go. <laughs> um, all right. It's also important to point out the difference between reserves and strategic reserves to people too, because I think people get confused about that, and it's a bad it's bad uh, rule wording from from GW, but it is what it is. Uh, so this guy gives you. A five plus feel no panic and psychic and tanks and mortal wounds, which is just just a strictly worse benefit from the um, uh, from the shield host ability, but that's okay. I guess they don't get it against psychic attacks, which is probably not that not super relevant. Um, but it does come up occasionally. Get wrecked, thousand suns, I guess. Deadly unity gives you plus one to hit on anathema psychana units. That's probably good on. Vigilators, because I think their weapon skill three, but their attacks are pretty solid. Uh, but they have to be within six of a custodian unit, which is, I guess, not super, um, not it doesn't happen all the time. Uh, uh, so the strategy can target two units as long as one of them has the anathema psychonic keyword. That's cool. These include uh, a reactive move. When enemy moves, a normal move advance or fall back. Within nine, you can run away. That's really good. <laughs> People already take Ceaseless Hunter <laughs> for basically that reason on custodian units. And this one, importantly, you can target two up to two custodian units, but it but you can just use that stratagem on a Adeptus Custodius unit you, it, it, by themselves if there are no anathema stuff. What's your opinion on Imperial Knights spending the last two weekends at a sub 40% win rate the last two weekends? I think the win rate will falter until mission play improves. Um, yeah, I think, uh, it sucks for them. I think Imperial Knights are in a really bad spot and, um, I don't exactly know. I think they just need to get rid of the stupid restriction on bondsman abilities. I think that we talk, I mean, we talked about it every week, right? We talked about it for, for ages last week. Um, you can go, go check out my stream last week. If you want to, if you want to hear a lot long, a detailed discussion on Imperial Knights being just terrible. <laughs> but, like, at the end of the day, they designed this codex with a lot of internal synergy that worked pretty well and was really cool. And then they, they uh, on a knee-jerk reaction to the towering role being too strong, like, did a, did a, like, you know, vision from Avengers style phase into the guts of the codex and just ripped it out. And I don't think that we're going to see them do much better than they already are until that changes um, with the current data sheets that they have, I guess I should say. Like, they could go in and, and replace every war dog, like, armager with a... <laughs> or replace every armager with a war dog, and you'd probably see them do better. But um, as it stands, they just have, like, abilities in their army that don't really do anything which is really crappy uh, so yeah i think uh, i think that's my, that's what i that's what they got to do and i don't know if there's much like saving imperial knights as a faction right now until you get it you get down to the bones of it and and fix them up or like wildly improve their points value i guess but i don't know if anybody really wants that i don't think what we want is for imperial knights to get hyper efficient and be this like t12 skew list uh, I think what we want is for Imperial Knights to be synergistic again and, and have uh, interesting internal faction abilities that they can use, uh, which they don't have right now. So that's what I'd like to see for them. I would love to see Imperial Knights back in the in the forefront, but it is tough currently. The good players went elsewhere. Yeah, there's a couple people like still on the on the um, 
on the night's train, but we they're, I'm, like, they're few and far between, right? Like, if you want to play the big stompy robot faction, just play War Dogs, because War Dogs are really good. They do the same thing that Armagers do, except better in every way. They're like, plus one weapon skill, ballistic skill, if you're a brigand. Why? I don't know. Um, because they weren't built around <laughs> a bondsman ability that be became really bad, <laughs> I think is the, the answer. Um, yeah, I don't know. The Demon's Stratagem says Strategic Reserves, is it? Um, oh, wait, but it's if you have uh, Strategic Reserves and you um, and you have if you're in Strategic Reserves and you have Deep Strike, you can come in first battle round. That was uh, the the um, clarification they made at World Championships. Uh, yeah, so it's, who? I got a pop-up. No good. Um, so it's like a, it's a world championships thing. Uh, if you have strategic reserves, if you're in strategic reserves, the ways that you arrive in the battlefield first battle round is, um, if you have deep strike, you arise, you, 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 you revert to using deep strike. Or they also said that if you um, are required to arrive in the battlefield at a specific time, that overrides the normal restriction. So, like, the game literally blue screens if you if you use a stratagem on the first turn because you are both required to and, and prevented from putting the unit back on the table. Um, Am I stupid for taking knights to the Tacoma Open at this point? I don't want to just abandon my faction. No, I don't think you're stupid. Uh, I, I think one thing that, um, that I guess here's, I'll, I'll, I'll pull up and well, well, while we're talking about this, I'll, I'll pull open the, uh, world championships FAQ and then we can talk about that. Um, the thing to keep in mind is that, um, like win rates are only part of the story. And if you are like confident in your faction and good at 40k you're gonna do better than the win than like the win rates will tell you right like have playing an army that has a, a loot like a, a sub 50 percent win rate doesn't mean that you're gonna lose automatically gonna lose half of your games uh it means that you are going to it means that you you know you just have to be good you know <laughs> you know what i mean um so it's not impossible that knights will win a gt or do well at a gt it's just slightly more difficult than it is for most for other factions but it doesn't mean that they can't win um and we have we do see knights you know very not super often but occasionally win win gts and get to undefeated placements so i i would not um unless you're like unless you are basically out to win the entire event um like win a super major or whatever i would not let faction win rates influence your your army decision too much you should play whatever you're comfortable with and what you want to play because that's what you're going to do best with um hands down uh yeah so here's the world championships faq document um some abilities will, uh, allow a unit to um Remove a unit from the battlefield after the round, the first battle round has started and place it into strategic reserves. Uh, if that ability states it will arrive back in the reinforcements up of your next movement phase, which is what this one does, um, then uh, can you arrive in the battlefield during the first battle round? And the answer is yes. Um, some abilities remove a unit from the battlefield, state the unit will return in your next movement phase, but do not make use of strategic reserves or deep strikes. So that's like a teleport assault that allows you to arrive in the first battle round. Um, and there is a rules commentary that says that if you have deep strike and you go to strategic reserve, you use the deep strike ability, which doesn't have the restriction that you come in on the first battle round as well, which is what influenced that FAQ. But if you want to point to any any precedents that that concretely allows you to, to uppy downy on the first battle round, then then the World Championships FAQ is where you go.
Yeah, also, that's a good point, too. Like, I don't know when Tacoma Open is, um, but uh, I, we're probably, we're probably, what, three or four weeks away from a data slate update, right? So, like, oh, our win rate, the win rates are all, are all bad right now. And you're like, well, that could change in the next three weeks, you know? <laughs> Uh, does Codex write, overwrite the core rulebook? Not really. There's actually no rules hierarchy rules in 40k, uh, which is a problem. <laughs> Generally speaking, the way that you should write, uh, you should view the rules is that a more um, specific, the more specific that the rule is, the it will override more general rules. So saying like you can and you can go into strategic reserve means like okay. That means you can't come in the first battle round because there's a specific strategic reserve rule that says you can't come in the first battle round. Um, but there, if there's an ability that says, like, you can come into strategic reserve on round two, <laughs> right, that will, like, override a rule that says you can come in any battle round from strategic reserve or something. Uh, but it's kind of an issue with 40k rules. That that, that 40k tends to fall apart the, the more closely that you <laughs> analyze it <laughs> from a mechanical standpoint. The Bondsman thing is why people like Winters SEO say they shouldn't change the core mechanics of a book. They shouldn't change the core mechanics of a book, not the points. I mean, they like they shouldn't change the core mechanics of a book. They should change the points instead. Um, I mean, I don't totally agree with that. I think that there are instances in which the core mechanics are a new need to change because there's like a there's a something that's too strong, and to some extent, like you can't. It's it's good to have more levers to pull from a balance standpoint because um, sometimes you can't fix every problem just by making things more expensive. You can you can fix the problem in that you can make the thing so expensive that it's not worth playing anymore, but that's not a way to make a healthy game. So I don't think that they that you should never change like the, the verbiage of a rule, but I do think that they should be more careful about it. And I think that that first FAQ, that was something from like the first data slate update, I think. Um, or maybe the second one. It was like very early. That was like a total knee jerk. Um, and I think, I don't know, it kind of exposes the bias a little bit where they were like, oh no, we can't have knights be good because they're like a, they're a weird skew list. Um, so we'll, we'll like, we'll, we'll just suplex them into the dirt. But Eldar, we have to go slow with Eldar. And you're like, come on, man. What are you doing? Eldar destroyed the game for like three months. <laughs> Longer than that, right? It's almost six months crazy seems to fall apart more in this edition than previous um i don't think that's the case i think this edition is probably the best uh it's in terms of like rules verbiage i think it is it is clearly the the, the best edition that we've done um that they've had at least as long as i've been playing but it's not perfect is the issue but you know we'll get there eventually every edition is like a, a progressive update from the past ones all right imagine if they only did points how much cheaper can mechanicus get yeah that's like a good example right it's like guys we, we wrote this codex it's just really bad so we'll just heavily discount everything a million times and you're like okay but this army is unplayable because you physically like you can't purchase a 2000 point army like they get ready to run out of stock before you finish buying all your models So, a little bit weird that the, they're all about teamwork, right? But these, um, the enhancements are just, like, strict buffs. You get, you get stealth outside 12, or not even, extra, extra hard to kill. Uh, you get plus one to wound. That's, um, like, normally they would be, like, you know, plus one to wound, and you get to reroll ones to wound if you're within six inches of an anathema or psychonic like unit. It's, it's a little bit strange that they just like forgot that stuff. But to be fair, I guess it would be kind of annoying to keep track of. Um, new episode of Battle Report pits the armies together. That's exciting. Get to do a little battle report. Peek through. Would it be? Would it be like? 
how how hard do you think I would get copyright struck if we did like a watch party on the on the battle report? Not like a not just like watching it, but like running through and talking about the new rules. I'd probably get copyright struck pretty hard, right? I don't know. I'll think about it. Mm -mm. Oh, you're right, chat. Yeah, it's within 12, not outside 12. Uh, but it also affects melee attacks too. It's not range attacks, so it's actually really good. You're just you're just minus one to be hit from melee, and also from shooting attacks sometimes, which is pretty strong actually. That's a, these are these enhancements, unironically, real good. You probably take both of those. Uh, and I don't know, a reactive move is good. Plus one AP is good. I think this detachment might be okay. Like when it comes down to it, right? You're losing a, you're you have a worse field up in against mortal wounds situationally, than you do into sh in shield host, and you lose. Um, the field no pain against devastating, which is a big loss. I won't like I, I'll I'll be real with you, but you gain some really good strats. I guess you probably lose the fight first, which would be a unfortunate. Although they said the shield house is being entirely rewritten, so who knows? Who knows if it has any of the same stuff? This actually feels like it might be an okay detachment chat, and I don't think it's because of this energy. I think this energy is kind of meaningless. I think it's because these are these effects that they've shown off are really strong. I don't know. We'll see. Um, have they made Warhammer Plus better? I don't believe so. So honestly, like when Pariah and Nexus came out, I bought a subscription and I forgot to cancel it. So I still have it and I have not opened it one time. <laughs> They're just <laughs> siphoning money from me. CGW, you can, you can have my money. You make money off of me, I, I swear. Um, and uh, I think they came out with like Pariah Nexus and like Battle Reports and maybe some Lore Master stuff. And I haven't heard about any other animations or anything that came out, came out of them. It's just, uh, I don't know. At least it's only like $5. At least it's not like a $15 a month subscription like Netflix or something. So, but it definitely doesn't feel like it has enough value. Um, all right, chat. It's not well. It's not linked to having your sis your sister's units next to your custodian's units. You actually don't need to do that at all, right? Like that's a that's an additional buff that you get if you have them. You get you basically get a shitty version of the shield host detachment roll back, but that roll is like situationally not that useful, right? There's like ninety percent of matchups you're gonna go into and it does nothing, um, especially because you're focused on wardens most of the time anyway, and wardens. The turn that it matters will just have a four plus field no pain against all attacks, not just the ones that that protect you against. Um, so you can have like a you can trade that detachment ability for what seems like some really good other stuff, and it and it definitely requires the rest of the things in that detachment to be that similar power level. But like having a, a plus one AP on a stick, plus one to like a minus one to hit enhancement. A plus one to wound enhancement and a reactive move just on a stick is like really strong. That you you get extra benefits from them if you target if you have your sisters of silence next to you. But you can just target a custodian like warden squad with one of them. Because the only restriction is that you have you can select two units if one of them is a psychana and they're both within six. But you can just choose one unit. Which I like. That's like a that's a that's a good uh, that's just solid um, solid design. I think it's a, an extra benefit if you play to the strength of the detachment. All right, chat. Let's talk about some lists. Uh, we had a lot of we have a lot of lists to talk about today. We wanted to talk about the Maelstrom Thingamajiggy, the North Star Team Tournament. Did 
This one. That's the one that uh, we wanted to discuss. Uh, all right, which squad are we talking about? Which 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 team are we looking into today? Uh, 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 uh. I don't know. It's probably this one, I imagine. It's this Tyranid list. Can it work if you have your sister in a rhino? I think that... I don't believe that it works... Uh, well, you, 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 you don't affect anything on the battlefield if you're in a transport. The Psychana rhino might just have the keyword, though. Um... Yeah, the, so uh, unless this changes, obviously. The Anathema Psychana Rhino is an Anathema Psychana unit, appropriately. So if you just take Psychana Rhinos, then then you get the benefit. But, like, I don't know if you really want to be spending Rhino points to, really like, not really do anything, right? To just, like, give your dudes a feel-no-pain. Like, it's kind of cute, but... Um, it's so situational, I think, that you, 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 you have your, like... A witch seekers and your vigilators and like those guys are are okay units to begin with and like alea maybe and then you use them to like project the buff if you don't need them to do utility stuff i think it's like a little bit of a of a, of a little tiny benefit if you have your utility units next to your big guys but i wouldn't like build the whole team around it seventh place Seven plates on teams. Oh boy. Maelstrom Gaming Studios. Oof. What happened? One, two, two. Um. Oh, but I had the tiered list right, right? Yeah, okay. Fair enough. I had the tiered list. Oh, that's true, chat. Yeah, you actually still have to have the unit. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> the rhinos would just explode <laughs> if you didn't take the psychonic unit in them. Yeah, no, nope, you're right. You'd have to have a unit somewhere. But, like, I guess you could take, you could put your, like, witch seekers inside them and then scout and then just, like, get out and do stuff with them and have the rhino, like, projecting the aura. But, like, is that worth 75 points? I don't know. Probably not. And in a, a giving a bring it down occasionally. Um, all right. Let's talk about some unending swarm. So, this is a team event. And I don't know exactly how the team... I guess we could read the player packet here. How their team event uh, system worked. They... Um, pairings. Um, okay, so they use like a WTC style. So they have like a defender list. You choose two attackers and then the, the defending team pairs them essentially. So lists that are super good at scoring um, are usually have like a, an extra bonus in the uh, the team format for a couple reasons. First of all, what you want to be doing is beating your opponent by a certain margin in order to get a big win from them. So uh, just to elucidate how the team pairing the team system works for people. Um, you know, I guess we can look at pairings. Uh, you, after the, the points in the game are determined, you're assigned a differential score based on how hard you beat your opponent. So, um, basically you're trying to get 50 or more po victory points above your opponent in each game, because that gives you 20 points and your opponent gets zero. If the differential is any narrower than 50, then uh, you split the points based on that differential out of 20. So that's why we see like, you know, we won by um, a at least uh, whatever that number is, uh, like 13 points or whatever, um, or 35 points. Uh, and the opponent then only gets five, you get 15 out of the 20. Um, and the total of that 
differential determines whether you win or lose the round. So in order to get big wins, in order to actually flip the team score, you have to you have to score tons of points. But the, the opposite is also true. If you lose by a very slim margin, then it ends up being like only an 11-9 win, for example, or even a 10-10 draw. So what you can do in some situations is create armies that are super duper scoring centric that you can then offer as the defender army. And it basically doesn't matter what your opponents pair into it because you can, you're always guaranteed to score like a 10, 10 or like a nine 11, uh, differential. So lists like these, you tend like skewy lists that just like are like force weird matchups and can score a million points, um, tends to have much be much stronger in a team format be for that exact reason. And so team formats, you often see like very strange lists popping up. We saw like a bunch of like, you know, Canoptic, uh Wraith, like Awakened Dynasty lists at ATC, for example, because the, all they did was just sandbag the game forever and uh, and score at like, you know, and, and, and not lose by too many points. So those are those are called like defending lists. And this is, I think, a good example of that. Uh, we have a Neuro Tyrant, a Turvagon, a Winged Hive Tyrant. No buffs on him, but he's just there to give you your um, your free strats because the Unending Swarm has lots of battle tactics that you can use with his aura. Uh, gargoyle, big gargoyle unit. So you, you usually get one big 20 mana gargoyles for the um, unending swarm because then you can run them up the table. And oftentimes what you'll do is you'll you'll um, use the auto advance strat on them for free turn one with the tyrant to run them up to 18 inches, then shoot and move six more. So you move 24 inches and you basically entirely prevent your opponent from moving on the first round and then they die. And then you get to use the reinforcement strat um, if you banked your TP from the first turn to bring them, put them in back into reserve round two, deep strike them, shoot with them, and then move and body block again. So your opponent's army, if, it, if you've positioned it perfectly, your opponent's army only moves about six inches in the first two movement phases, <laughs> which is sometimes just loses them the game. <laughs> Not all the time, but sometimes it does. Um, and then you and then you use all the stuff in the back to run up and take the objectives later, so they don't score very many points. Uh, we then have some gargoyles, uh, twenty hormigants, twenty turbagants times four uh, with spine fists in them, and then we do have the turbagant inside the list as well. So you can use uh, there's a stratagem. It's another battle tactic that lets you um, critical on five ups, and the turbagant gives lethal hits to the unit. So you get sustained and lethal with a twin linked weapon. Um, on up to two termagant units if you duplicate the strat with the wing type tyrant. So uh, I guess that the with only one turbagant, only one of those is getting lethal hits. But it gives you pretty okay damage output from the turbagant. The termagants, it's not good, but it, it you know you'll kill you'll kill five space marines or whatever. Um, we have double exocrines, so we get rerolls and some anti -inf uh, heavy infantry shooting, uh, biovores. Double narrow lictors so we can source some wound rerolls. And uh, this also helps if your opponent is like contesting your objectives and you battle shock them in your command phase, then you steal the objective back too. So um, that can kind of uh, that can flip the primary in your favor. Three Ripper Swarms for doing secondaries and some Venom Thropes for stealth. Yeah, so we have the between the Biovore and the Ripper Swarms, lots and lots of units to do secondaries. This feels like it's feels like overkill in singles games a lot of times because you don't usually need both of these uh, modules to be able to max your, or, or get a higher score in your secondaries. But because you're trying to get as many points as, as, as like tyrannically possible um, in the team format, then you want as many scoring options as you possibly can have. Uh, but yeah, it's good stuff. It's pretty classic unending swarm. Um, but that's a, that is why they're good in the, in the good old team tournament. <laughs> Two hits are running yeah, with, with the horse penis gun. Yeah. <laughs> That's the strangle web gun. Uh, I hate that it's the one that shoots like the sticky strangly webs on them too. Yuck. Yucky. That's gross. Uh, all right, chat. Ryan, thanks for the uh, thanks for the suggestion in the super chat, by the way. 
Um, thanks everybody who super chatted so far. I appreciate y'all, you people. Uh, all right. So there's some other lists that I want to dive into, um, which are these guys down here. So like I mentioned in my video yesterday, these large events, this is the Alpine Cup singles. It was a six round tournament with a cut to top two. Um, and it used differential scoring. So part of the funny thing that happens <laughs> is that a, the most of these larger events in, and I believe Alpine Cup had a team component to it. Um, most of the, uh, that played after the singles event, I should say, it had a team tournament on it. So most of these players are like pre preparing for team events. Um, and in order for that to be more, uh, to, in order for that like to offer more practice, they use the same team scoring as they do in singles events. It creates a lot of draws, <laughs> as you can see, because you have to beat your opponent by uh, five or more victory points to actually win the game. Uh, and even then, if you win, you only get a little tiny baby win, um, which means that events that use this differential scoring tend to have a lot of undefeated players that have draws on their record. But it also means that we had a huge tie for the top, basically. So we had... Uh, what is this? One, two, three, four, five, six players with a uh, draw on their record, and then only two players that were undefeated going into the top, into round six. And then they cut to top two, so those players didn't get to play. But we get a lot of lists to talk about that are that were undefeated technically. So that's what we get to, to dive into this time around. Our custodians are the new Tyranids. <laughs> kind of. They're like the anti Tyranids, right? They're like, it's, it's exactly the opposite of Synapse. Are these lists from first class citizens or the underclass of Tau? Um, clearly first class citizens because we don't even have any Tau players. Look at all these Thousand Suns, though. And another undefeated Thousand Suns. Two draws, so not super high scoring. But also we had Thousand Suns go uh, top two. And uh, Arnie also undefeated with Thousand Suns. So much. So we'll, we'll talk about Thousand Suns first because I'm excited about it. And we'll, we'll do a little dive into, into the faction. So Paul Newberger lost in the finals, but was undefeated going into round five. Um, ooh, this list is spicy. So I, it feels like the faction almost on the whole has moved to double exalted sorcerer, disc exalted sorcerers, which I definitely understand because they're really good. They have a pretty good flamer and they slow down enemies uh, that are running at you. Which is definitely not what you want as a Thousand Suns player. You want to be able to kill all those guys. So two Disc Sorcerers. Triple Infernal Master. That's my favorite thing in the world. Infernal Masters are so chad. Um, one with Arcane Vortex. One with the Crystal so he can teleport. Plus a regular Sorcerer as the Lord of Forbidden Lore. So one interesting thing is that sometimes you see the Lord of Forbidden Lore on the Exalted Sorcerer. So that he can always double move himself. So one piece of... One little combo that you like you want to do is you if you're double moving people you run the exalted sorcerer out put their binding tendrils in someone so that halves their movement advance and charge rolls so they basically don't get to melee with you and then use the temporal surge to move them back into safety if they're the guy with lord of forbidden lore then you can target them with they can do it themselves so they're all you're always in range to do their your double move and you can even sometimes use them to get like kind of insane um like secondaries off because you can move them target them with temporal surge from someone else to move them and then replicate it with the lord of forbidden lord by themselves and move them a third time so you get to go super far 36 inches uh it is a little bit of an open question if you can duplicate it multiple times the i think the technical answer is yes but that gets ruled sometimes as you can't because it just says that um when he uses a a um when he uses a ritual, he can use a ritual that was already used earlier in the phase by somebody else. And the only restriction on rituals is that uh, a source uh, that you can't use them if someone else has already used them. So um, theoretically, he would get around that restriction. He could use it multiple times, but I don't know if that's the intention. Uh, there's one, two, three, four, five units of Rubik Marines. Holy crap. Plus one Rhino. Two units of cultists. I love the double cultists. And I'm a little bit interested that there's no meter with Vortex Beast in this list. Because that definitely helps out the little sorcerer who's uh, got the um, the Forbidden Lore to double move people super far away. But the double cultists is cool. 
that gives you lots of scoring potential. One unit is really good in concert with the Binding Tendrils guys because you can fling them out, slow people down, and then use the Cultist with Temporal Surge to run them up and surround other enemy units so they can't move anywhere. And you can basically, with one Cultist unit and one Disc Sorcerer, prevent like their entire army from going anywhere. Um... And then they die, and the cultists get UCP when they die. And then you get a second unit, and you do it again the second turn. So it's all about control. It's all it's 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 the blue deck. Everything's about hard control. Nope, you can't move. Nope, you're slow. Nope, you're movable blocked. Um, and uh, that's pretty cool. I also like the idea of keeping cultists in strategic reserve, and then pulling them out uh, in like later rounds to do secondaries and stuff. But just keeping them on the table and running up to, into the middle to do stuff is also good. Um, what do we have from Arna? Thousand Sons are the best army in the game. They have no auto-lose matchups. I definitely... Um, I definitely think that that is more true now than it was previously. They auto-lost to... Or, fun like, functionally. It wasn't immediately an auto-lose, but it was very... It was so difficult. It was practically automatic loss. Um, to Chaos Space Marines in the pre-nerf. But now that Chaos Space Marines are nerfed, they were I think they were the predator for Thousand Suns. Like, you didn't see Thousand Suns for a really long time because, like, they would just die to Chaos Space Marines. It was so bad. <laughs> um, but now that Chaos Space Marines got nerfed a thousand ways and nobody plays them anymore, I think... Thousand Suns are definitely in a pretty solid spot, which is a lot. Why a lot of people are playing with them, but they they're so difficult, and every, they're always on a knife's edge, right? Things can go really poorly for Thousand Suns if like Magnus just fails all the saves and dies really early, because if you lose Magnus too early in the game, there's no way you come back because your army doesn't do anything. Um, that they they're not they're not super consistent, if that makes sense. Like basically, all your damage output comes from these models essentially, and if any of them get like get like scalpeled out or you know things go poorly for you early your hazardous checks suck um you know your opponent like randomly kills a rubik marine squad with like bolters or something you're just like well probably gonna lose now <laughs> and that can definitely happen with them but they are they are in a in a pretty solid spot right now for sure gray knight's pretty good into thousand suns i could see that that matchup was always like I always enjoyed playing that matchup because it was like two armies with very similar um, kind of like similar like effects. Like they were both very mobility focused, but Thousand Suns did it with double moving and and um, uh, Grey Knights did it with with their teleports. Uh, and Thousand Suns can like windmill slam the four plus feel no pain against most of the Grey Knight guns. But I think that Nemesis Dread Knights definitely changed that or that uh, paradigm quite a bit because they do so much more damage at range than Terminators do. It used to be that Terminators would just like that you they couldn't really do too much to Thousand Suns and Thousand Suns would kill them, but Thousand Suns couldn't really outscore Grey Knights. Uh, but now I think that Thousand Suns gets shot to death. <laughs> but we'll see. We'll see how things end up. Certainly, I think more recently, Thousand Suns have been doing better than Grey Knights, which is a little surprising to me, but um, not too much so. I think a lot of people jumped on Grey Knights and then kind of got kicked in the shins and fell over. If people swing on Magnus and miss, it's the same thing? Um, I mean, I guess. Like, Magnus very rarely... Like, I, I think it's almost never the correct call to, like, commit in on Magnus and try to kill him. Because most of the time you see Thousand Suns lose, it's with only Magnus on the table. Um, because he just can't score everything by himself, right? He needs the rubrics, and the rubrics are so much easier to kill. You just kill everything that's not Magnus, and you just, like, lose a unit and a half to Magnus every turn and just accept that that's your life. But... Um, I mean, like, sometimes if you, like, overcommitted to him and then don't kill him, then you could die, but... I don't... I, like, that so rarely happens. I so rarely see people be like, oh, I'm gonna kill Magnus this turn, unless, like, they're just given it by a Thousand Suns player that doesn't know what they're doing. Like, that sometimes happens, but more often it's like, oh, I'll shoot this thing at Magnus, and he's like, I took 12 damage, and you're like, okay, well, now I'll try to kill him. <laughs> Most of the time, it's, you know, you, shoot, you take a pot shot at him or whatever, and you see what happens, but... It's hard to fully commit into that guy. 
Um, all right. So this time we got the two disc sorcerers, three infernal masters, one sorcerer, Magnus. Oh, is this the same list? <laughs> it's two rhinos. It's very different. What did we cut for the second rhino? That's a little. <laughs> that's a little boring. Uh, enlightened and. Which is definitely, I think, fair. Rhinos are better than Enlightened, but it's only if you have the extra 30 points. Enlightened are really not very good. They have a little reactive move, which is cute, but man, you're not that exciting. Uh, do we have an Arcane? Yeah, we have an Arcane Vortex. We have all of the enhancements. One, two, three, four, five, six units of Rubik Marines. One, two, three, four, five units of Rubik Marines. Is there like an extra character in this one? This one's Triple Infernal Master. Triple Infernal Master. Oh, you lose Aramon, I guess. Yeah, we just cut Aramon out of this list. Yeah, that's fair. Aramon's really good for like a big spike of damage, but he's not very good over the the whole of the round. You know, once he dies, he like you really feel it. And most of the time he has to hide in a rhino to begin with anyway, so he's you're not really getting you're spending a lot of points on him and you're not really getting that much benefit from it. Whereas you would much rather be have like the passive uh, Cabal Point generation of rubrics with a character just chilling somewhere. Um, but I think most of mostly kind of the same list. But Armand's good for the the once per game free free Twist of Fate usually or Doom Bolt. Talk about this one too while we're here. One more thousand suns for posterity. <laughs> Liam Vissel copied my castle list. Fair enough. So this one is, it's a Disc Aramon, and it's Exalted Disc Sorcerer. Only one of them. But we still have the Triple Infernal Masters. This name is Double Thousand Sun Sorcerer. I really like the Umberlific Crystal guy for the the, the regular Sorcerer, because he can, he can like, babysit your backline until you need him to go do something. And then he's so good at close range. The you, I always found that the Infernal Master... You would kind of be incentivized with our with the Umberlific Crystal to teleport him to do damage, but he's not really worth the damage just by himself. He needs to like also generate additional value. But this little dude, you teleport him to go get like behind enemy lines, and then he also gets to kill something because his gun is shorter range but does like infinitely more damage if you burn rerolls on him. Usually, um, the in, the regular sorcerer's gun, by the way, uh, if you haven't seen it, is maybe the silliest weapon profile in 40k. Uh, I'm just gonna get it on Wapia. It's you get, so you get lethal hits from from your dude, which is nice. But then uh, his weapon is a pistol, so it's like the aspiring sorcerer. He also gets to shoot his um, psychic weapon and his flamer pistol at the same time. So he's shooting three d6 total attacks. But his psychic, his psychic pistol weapon is only a range 12, but it's sustained three. <laughs> so when you burn rerolls on him, he hits on twos and you just reroll into sustains because the sustain, like he, he should get about like 30% more hits than he gets, than he starts with attacks if he rolls good. Although he can roll a bunch of fails and then do nothing. And then those hits will also get one lethal hit out of them too. Um, and then if you're on devastating wounds, you're just reeling for reeling to try to get devastating. And so he just gets like insane, insane amounts of damage with his little gun. He shoots like an average, he, he gets an average of like 11 or 12 hits or something. And then generates like four or five devastating from that. Uh, if he's full rerolling, which is kind of nutty. And then he uh, warp flames and then has the rest of his unit to shoot with too. Um, but he's so hard to get shots with because he's only range 12 that it's uh, kind of a clunky thing. Less so if you're uh, deep striking, though. Got a bunch of Rubik Marines with Warp Flamers, a Zangor unit. Kind of fun. Just a little, little brick of guys with chainsaws to get Cabal points for you. Two Cultist units and one Rhino. Yeah. Kind of the same idea, but we're, we're just changing little things for player um, people's uh, preference, I guess. Run him with Arcane Vortex to do ridiculous damage. Yeah. <laughs> Vortex of Doom also murders Magnus because he can't pop feel no pain. 
Uh, yeah, you you have to remember to shoot the vortexes into him too. That's like kind of the tension of that matchup. You also you have to make sure that nothing touches Magnus. Magnus actually doesn't do anything in that matchup. He's kind of like forces the um, the uh, Green Knight player to like try to fight him. He will kill a bunch of Green Knights if you let him. Um, but it's also very easy to stop him from being able to shoot you. But what you like, you can you can construct a fortress for him where nobody can get, or like one guy can get in range to to vortex and doom him, and then he's like sick, and then he he blows him up, um, and and then you're just like forcing gray knights to come in and and engage with the rest of your army, and then he gets to counter punch them. That's kind of like the tension of that matchup. It's really interesting. Uh, but you also have to make sure that, like, Drago doesn't charge him or something, because that dude would just, like, one-shot him, too. <laughs> it's very dangerous for, for, for Magnus. That is the one army that could probably commit in and blow up Magnus, too. <laughs> but the Arcane Vortex on the um, the little ba the little baby sorcerer is uh, incredibly funny. That guy is... Um, he can do so insane. I think that you most of the time want it on the Infernal Master just for like consistency, because he he, um, you're you're more excited about like raw damage with the with the Infernal Master, and you you get on Overwatch too. Like you don't usually Overwatch with the Sorcerer guy, but you will with the Infernal Master because his gun's a torrent. So getting the two damage on the opponent's turn is like pretty high value, but um. You also can, uh, you also can, um, use it more offensively too. You're also like kind of contractually obligated to do full rerolls on him if you have the vortex attached, I found, but it is cute. I do like it. Uh, speaking of gray knights, let's talk about gray knights. Florian Schmidt in here, uh, X01 with gray knights. Four O and one. Triple librarians. We're back, boys. The big librarian bricks. Although I don't think we have Terminators for them. They're just by themselves. First to the fray with the Brotherhood Librarian. So he can um, he can drop in uh, a turn early. That's kind of cool. Oh, this list has Canis Rex. Whoa, wait. This list is spicy as hell. Holy crap. Hold up. Hold up. Hold up. Hold up. So it's Triple Librarian. One gets first to the fray. So he can drop in based on your tactical draws turn one. Um... A Nemesis Grandmaster with Sigil, so he can run away. Another Nemesis Grandmaster. Triple Nemesis Dread Knights in a Strike Squad. A Kalidus Assassin in Canis Rex. This list is rad. What? <laughs> uh, we saw previously that there was that list that ran triple Land Raider Redeemers. And this list feels like it's basically doing the same thing, but the Redeemers have been taken. Their spot has just been taken by Canis Rex and the Librarians. And that gets you more units on the table. Like, the Redeemers can't teleport, right? So they're going to be less flexible than just having all the Librarians jumping around. Um, plus, we have a Kalidus for uh, CP tax, if we need it. And then just a bunch of Dread Knights. So we have, like, this huge backline of shooting from Dread Knights. And then Canis Rex just punches whatever we need to in the middle of death. And we're just, like, going from there. And then you have Librarians to, like, Vortex and do actions. This is, this is like ridiculous. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right. Fair enough. I don't think there's much else to say about that. Holy crap. Yeah. All right. Sure. I guess the downside is that like we can't do any reactive stuff with Canis, right? We don't have like mists and, and stuff to buff him. Or to to um, keep him um, from being engaged, but that's probably fine. There's a video on Wargames Live of this list versus World Eaters. Oh shit, is there? That sounds amazing. I didn't watch, because I was streaming all weekend, so I didn't get to watch the... Um, Joe cover Alpine Cup stuff, but I do know he did it. Do you know what, um, which stream it was in? I kind of want to, I just want to see. Necrons, Blood Angels. 
Uh, Chaos Knights, Necrons. Wait, what? Did I just click on the same video twice? Oh, I did. Eldar, Thousand Sons, Eldar. I can't find it, chat. That's amazing. I love that. This is just the like Pacific Rim, the list. I love it. Every, and he's a big robot. <laughs> That's so Chad. Um, we got a little bit of Leagues of Votan going on. From Will Furiman. Um, we are running double end here champion. One Hearthkin Warrior, double Sagittor. So we're kind of off the huge Sagittor like swarms that we saw in the last couple of weeks from Leagues of Otan, which is nice. Uh, two Chthonian Berserks probably going in the Sagittors. And then double Land Fortresses. Oh, so we could put the um, Chthonians into the Land Fortresses and then just fill the Sagittors with the Hearthkin, I guess, is probably what we do. Uh, triple Hearthkin Pioneers, so a six and two threes. It's SP conversion beamers on the fortresses. And then 15 Hearthguard. Man, Hearthguard are expensive. God damn. 32 points model. That's a lot. I guess they are pretty good. Um Cool. I don't know. It's still so interesting that Leagues of Votan have like so many <laughs> so many different like compositions. Usually, you see the Max Rankin Pioneers because they're so useful. You get a big unit that can start on the table and scout up and then pin your opponent. And then two little units who can help out with that, but they also can uh, jump into reserve to come off the table edge and do your reserves later on, your, your tacticals later on, too. Um, but we also have, like, the double Sagittors that can scout alongside that and then disembark like idiots later on to go do actions. And then you're just following all that up with, like, a billion Hearthguard and uh, land fortresses. That seems this one. I like this version. This is like very well rounded. You have a little bit of everything. You're not you're not going all in on one archetype or another. It's not triple land fortress. It's not six sagittors. It's like a little of both, which I think is pretty cool. Still waiting to see a laser Botan triple call list. That deep strikes a ton of the little guys, like a ton of the hearth guard. The, the hearth guard are a little tough because they, you have to use them very deliberately to get value out of them. They're so expensive. I mean, they're just like small Terminator bricks, right? They basically cost the same and have like the same profiles. So if you get too aggressive with them, then you just lose hundreds of points of units for like no reason. Which I think is why you only see like 10s and 15s uh, in those very specific situations. But they're so powerful when they're used correctly. Um, it's just hard to do that. All right, um, got some sisters here too. Matt Bonet running a cannoness uh, with saintly example, so she dies and then comes back. And usually she jumps into a, a combat squad of battle sisters, and then gets, plays like super aggressively and gets bunched to death, and then gets gets you a bunch of miracle dice. Ephraim uh, uh, Stern and Kaiganel, the Demonifuge. And Morven Ball. So we have a Sister Squad and an Emulator. So uh, the Cannoness usually jumps into like the aggressive portion of the Sister Squad, and that all embarks into the Emulator. And the Cannoness gives them hit rerolls, and then the Emulator gives them wound rerolls. So with your Melta Gun and Multi Melta, you're getting on top of your Miracle Dice full hit and wound rerolls with that unit, which is like kind of nuts. Then we have Double Rhinos. That's going to be jumping in Arco Flagellants, uh, Triple Castigator with Battle Cannons. Hot damn. 2x2 Crusaders, a Paragon Warsheet Squad for Morven. One Penitent Engine. I love the little the little one-offs of the Penitents are so good because they're not the easiest thing in the world to kill. Um, they're kind of dangerous because uh, they have like flamers and then two damage melee weapons with the with the blades. And uh, they generate you miracle dice when they die. So they're basically they're like a really obnoxious utility unit. And when you think about it, most people pay 60 points for a utility unit of, like, five idiots who might have infiltration or something. And the Penitent Engine actually does damage. And if your opponent doesn't kill it, uh, it's going to run amok. But if they do kill it, it gets you Miracle Dice, so you're, like, totally fine with it. 
Um, for a hot minute, I think we were seeing like two or three little penitent engines inside most lists, which is cool. Call can make the Hearthkin Deep Strike. Does he transition Deep Strike to the entire unit if he has a Porty Crest? Oh, yeah, he does. Yeah, that's interesting. It's a lot of points, though. You're like min you're in for like minimum 140 almost, right? How many points are Hearthkin Warriors? Like 120? 110. So 125 points for the call plus like five Hearthkin if you're splitting them in a Sagittor. I don't know. It is cute, though. <laughs> just team strike endless numbers of, like, just little morons. <laughs> I feel like the auto cannon is just outright better than the battle cannon because it's twin linked. That's such a... It's so funny because that's so controversial within the sisters community. It's like people... people I think people have actually been killed <laughs> over their selection of the castigator weapon. <laughs> um... So they get uh, reroll hit rolls against infantry with with the auto cannons, but they get it against monsters and vehicles with the battle cannons, which is like usually more um, uh, more valuable. But you get the twin linked on the ca the auto cannon, but you get ignore cover on the battle cannon. So like the battle cannons basically AP two. Um, and it doesn't need the twin linked against most infantry, like like heavy infantry stuff, uh, because it's strength ten. So you're wounding basically everything on at least threes, if not twos. Um, if you're shooting at like custodians, or if you're shooting at like aggressors, and it's well enough statted that it kills them without the twin linked. Um, the auto cannon's like more consistent against that stuff, I guess, but le lower AP, so they save more often. Um, the downside is the battle cannon against like high toughness stuff, I think, because then you're just like, you're trying to get fives to wound with no modifiers and it's a little bit awkward, but that high toughness stuff tends to be a good enough save that it's fits in cover. You're not really doing much with the, with the battle or the auto cannon shot anyway. So I, it, it's interesting because I think there are arguments for both. Um, I think the consensus is the battle cannon is a little bit more well-rounded because of that ignore cover, but I don't think it's like clear cut. Twin linked is a, is a hell of a drug. I know Dutes loves the auto cannons because you're just like you shoot an infant like a big infantry unit and you're just rerolling hits, rolling wounds, and you probably get all all eight through if you get the rapid fire. And then like you're just forcing them to take saves, and you're also taking three heavy bolters usually too. So you're you're dumping you know whatever seventeen shots and then making them take saves against it, which usually kills a, something at the very least. You're forcing enough dice on them that they will fail. Uh, but the Castigator gets less dice, but more high value. So, I don't know. The auto cans for infantry, but it's better against high toughness. Yeah, it's weird that the... Like, I feel like the Battle Cannon wants to have lethal hits or something, you know? Because then you'd be like, reroll hit rolls, but you, know, you get more of a chance to get lethals. The ignore cover is a little bit funky. It feels like they had to tack ignore cover onto AP1 stuff because AP1 against a three up save vehicle without ignore cover is so bad. Um, and that's just like a problem with the cover mechanic. I think cover is too strong, but it is what it is. We're, we're so far past that discussion that I don't think it's worth having. You also can't fire the battle cannon if you're engaged. Well, you can shoot it at something else. You can't fire it at your feet, but. Don't get engaged. I don't know how often I've seen castigators engaged. That feels like your arcoflagellants are doing something wrong. <laughs> Should have had your arcoflagellants there, my guy. Uh, we've them got double seraphim and a zephyrim squad chilling out too. Good stuff. It's nice to see the cannon S and sister squad kind of on the table again. We haven't seen that one in a while. Otherwise, it seems like sort of normal normal stuff. And it's also interesting to see a bit of a 
combination between like the all armored sisters list and the very infantry focused sisters list. It feels like the triple castigator kind of threads that needle pretty nicely. I like the castigator profile. I think it's kind of a success as a um, a battle tank data sheet, in my opinion. All right, let's dive into some Necrons, chat. Uh, we got some Hyper Crypt Legion Necrons. Uh, uh, uh. Ooh, with a, a Risen Tyrant Locust Lord. All right, what is he in? Is he in regular Locusts or is he in Heavies? Heavies with Enmitic Annihilators. Dude, this combo doesn't get played often enough. So they get um, they get the Plasmancer, like, enhanced criticals, basically, if the Locust Lord's in the unit. And then they get Sustained 1 when they shoot Infantry. Um, and uh, rerolls the hit when they Deep Strike. So they, they shoot it. They basically kill, like, any Infantry in the game, almost. Um, they don't ignore cover, and they're only AP 1, which is, sucks a little bit, but... They do enough damage that they'll force like so many saves on you. Unless you're a two plus save, you probably lose a bunch of models. I love that combo. It's so cool. It's it's probably not as good as other stuff, but it feels so tech every time every time you do it. You're just like, yeah, let's go. Just vaporize these like ten idiots. Um, we've got a hexmark destroyer with dimensional overseer, so we get more a bigger uh, teleport bank. One technomancer, two transcendicaton, two transcendicaton. Whoa. Okay, fair enough. The funny thing about these in Hypercrypt is that um, a lot of times what you'll do is you'll just like upy downy them turn one because they have Deep Strike built in and you'll throw them into the opponent's deployment zone with Cosmic Precision and then just leave them there for the whole game and they complete all your secondaries in their deployment zone. They're like, oh, I get behind enemy lines. I'll get engaged in all fronts. I'll get uh, deploy teleport armors and most armies can't kill two transcendent katan so it doesn't matter if they like <laughs> that they're just standing there you engage like a big hefty unit in melee and you just leave them there for the entire game it's very silly um so technomancer for the canoptic wraiths double doomsday arcs oh, this list is after my own heart did i make this list oh my god uh the doomsday arcs can can hyper phase to get good lines of sight with the cannons which is awesome and then a lot of times what they do is if your opponent gets like sandbagged on the Transcendent Katan and then then the Nightbringer, you can pop the Doom Break Doom's Arcs off the side. And if they can't, if they don't have enough stuff to dedicate to dealing with them, they just get to to stand still and get devastating wounds. And once the Doom's Arc stands still and hits on twos, oh boy, do they go off? It gets real real messy. Uh, Flayed one unit for Uppy Downies on turn one. Some Locust Destroyers for utility, and one Heavy Destroyer with a Destructor just to hang out. Cool. This list rules. I I love those. Uh, the Necron list with all the... Or the Hypercrypt list with all the, like, little Immortal squads or whatever. And all the little technical guys. They're all right, I guess. But I love the, the list with all the big guns in them. Those are my favorite. Uh, this is another Hypercrypt. And this is the other version. <laughs> we immediately got it. One Chronomancer, one Plasmancer. A Dimensional Overseer Hexmark. Uh, Nightbringer Void Dragon. A bunch of Immortals. So uh, probably the big unit for the Chronomancer and a little unit of five for the Plasmancer with the Risen Tyrant. So they get the, I guess he might go into the big unit. I don't know. We have the Cryptex for the Immortal units either way. So the Chronomancer gives them the shoot and scoot so they can sh move after shooting. And the Plasmancer gives them the expanded criticals. So one can do damage and one can be good at taking objectives away. Uh, Death Marks, because they have Deep Strike baked in. Flayed Ones... A Scarab unit to do secondaries early. A bunch of Locust Destroyers. Double Doomsday Arcs. And a Monolith. Whoa. That's kind of cool because we can we can force... We can kind of do the same thing, right? But we're in, in place of two Transcendent Katan, we're using the Monolith. Where it can just Cosmic Precision into an annoying spot. And then you can um, uh, Quantum Shield it. So it's super hard to, to one tap, and then the same turn you can pop the Doomsday Arcs out. Not turn one, obviously, uh, if your opponent's hiding really a lot. But um, when the Monolith commits, you can pop the Doomsday Arcs out and shoot, and then like they they have to choose what they deal with because they probably can't deal with all three of them in one turn. If they can, you would have lost anyway. <laughs> but uh, you probably Alpha struck them for enough damage that they have a tough time hitting you back, and then the Doomsday Arcs can chill and, and blow people up. <laughs> 
<laughs> lost to three chance and it's an LVO. He scored seven every turn standing in the back line. It's so brutal, dude. Yeah, they just hop into the back and hang out. Um, yeah. Yep. It's a it's a thing that the so many so many games you just see that little dude just hang out back there. What does the thumbnail mean? Yeah, we talked to, we we had a, a big long discussion about town in the beginning. If you scroll back to the beginning of the of the live stream, uh, we we had a, a whole a whole talk about them. All right, well I think that that's all the undefeated from Alpine Cup. Uh, so we'll probably do a little bit of exploration. If anyone has any factions they want to talk about or or events that they want us to talk about, please go ahead and throw it in the chat as we uh, as we dive around. Now I know there were a couple events that I didn't think I don't think I got to talk about all of the lists on my video yesterday. This one I did. We talked about both players from the Iron Cage. Um, I think that. There was another Grey Knights that went X, O, and 1. I talked about them already. Uh, there was an Ultramarines list I didn't talk about, but that one was kind of boring. Yeah, that was this one. And I believe I did not talk about this Eldari list, so. A draw in the finals chat. What more could you ask for for a, a super sick competitive game? 73 point draw uh, in the finals of Imperialis Capilla, third anniversary. Um, Jose Valenzuela running Eldari. Eldari had a great weekend, by the way. I talked about it on my video. That's why that was the whole point of the video. But they they like came out of the woodwork. They came out swinging. They also we saw some pretty solid Eldari even at the event that I was uh, streaming. Um, I think we had uh, Eldari was like third place or something. Four, four and one, and lost to uh, the Tau that had got that got to the finals. Um, lots of cool Eldari lists too. Liam Vissel's list from uh, Alpine Cup was like kind of insane. Mm-mm. Orcs and Death Guard. I don't know if there's too much orcs be beyond the orcs that uh, won over the weekend. Um there's uh there, there are not too many orc players sit chilling around right now, but I'm sure that'll change when their codex seems out. Uh this list is running a Phoenix Shem Autark, boring. An Avatar of Kane, Farseer, Flagan. Spirit Seer. Ten Fire Dragons. Jesus. Do we have a transport for them? No. <laughs> We're just ground pounding, boys. No wave serpents today. <laughs> um, I have to remind myself what Fagin gives the Fire Dragons. He gives them plus one to hit? Is that right? Plus one to hit. Oh, nailed it. That was easy. So they hit on twos, assuming he joins, which he probably does. Um, they get reroll ones to wound and damage. But they don't have uh, fire support. So they're just like rolling fives or miracle dicing. But they also give reroll ones to Fuegan as well. Not to hit, but the other stuff. <laughs> ten, 10 fire dragons with the with the exarch that, or with the uh the phoenix lord that's nuts three d weapon support uh d can support weapon platforms two units of sweeping hawks for utility two units of warp spiders for doing whatever they do and then 10 wraith blades holy crap <laughs> what is this list there are 10 wraith blades and 10 fire dragons the wraith blades are like so weird this what a classy Oh, plus an avatar of Kane. What a classy list. This is like the classiest Eldar list I've ever seen in my life. Jose over here is just like, hey man, you want a big fight in the middle? We're gonna have a fight in the middle. And you're like, what? You're Eldar. Aren't you gonna like do some weird chicanery and like shoot me and then run away? He's like, no, 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 no. I'm gonna put 10 Wraith Blades in the middle. I'm gonna back him up with uh, 11 Melta Guns. 
<laughs> and we're just gonna have a big, a big fight. <laughs> um, these guys are running force shields, so they have a four plus invuln. Uh, they get plus one to hit, right, with the spirits here attached as well. So they at least they go to weapon skill three, or they hit on threes, I should say, more accurately, and then they can get regenerated. So they. They're T7 with a 2-up, 4-up. Um, yeah, I guess that's that's what it is. It's just a big unit of idiots just chilling and being hard to kill. Hey, we're being hard to kill, and we regenerate if you don't kill us. So take that. Seems good. With so many, like redeploys and stuff happening right now i feel like just holding down an objective like pre permanently is actually kind of strong because a lot of people are like oh i'll use little units and then we'll trade them and this elder list is like no <laughs> i refuse <laughs> we, will. we will take the objective and we will live there and you'll like it fuegan alone also mega chat yeah yeah fuegan by himself is like sort of nuts uh, sometimes you see him in a five man of, of fire dragons. I've never seen him in a 10. That's insane. <laughs> That's so crazy. <laughs> I love that. Looking at Liam Vistles list have no clue how it works. Dude, after watching far too many games of Liam Vistles, Liam Vistle play Harlequins. Let me tell you that man makes it work. He loves his MSU. My guy. He will, he will score every possible point, and you'll just be like, well, you got it, man. There's nothing I can do. Uh, having so many, like, b baked in fast movers and, and fire and fades is also helpful, too, because it has, like, shadow specters, and it just has, like, you know, warp spiders, swooping hawks. You know, it's, it could just bounce around the table. So you're, it's, it's always in the correct position to, and then, like, a bunch of those units combined can tune up and kill something that's, like, hard to kill, right? You're like, oh, I need to kill a predator or whatever. You're like, well, two fight, you know, two warp prism or uh, uh, shadow prism units plus like some some devastating from some other guys will like certainly do it. Um. All right, Death Guard and Dark Eldar. Let's take a quick peek at. Uh, we'll take a quick, quick, quick peek at Alpine Cup. We'll see if we have any, any uh, Drakari. So is it two, two or two, one, two? Works. Three and two. These are not inspiring win person win rates. Everybody. And Death Guard. Oh, four and one Death Guard. Let's go, Thomas Anger. All right, let's well, real talk. Can we be serious for a second? This man's named Thomas Anger, and he's playing Death Guard and not World Eaters. My guy, you have to take a you have to take a uh, a page out of Lancelot's book and play the Knight faction because you're you know because of your name. You know what I mean? You gotta play Black Templars because you're the Knight guy. Um, two Terminator Sorcerers. Nuts. Plus Typhus. Now, here's the question. Do they have Terminator units to jump into? Yes. Just one. Well, this list is spice. Holy crap. What is this list? This this is cool. So it's two Terminator Sorcerers and Typhus. I imagine that Typhus is by himself. Or, uh, excuse me. I imagine that Typhus is in the unit of three Deshrad Terminators. Because that little brick is actually super destructive. They, they the, the Deshrad Terminators themselves are pretty cool. Uh, they get their, like, transhuman effect when you're attached a character into them. And then Typhus makes them minus one to hit. And they can project the minus one weapon skill aura on people. So you can be minus one to hit and wound or you could be minus two to hit and minus one to wound and have like a ton of two and three damage attacks so that unit is actually like super duper deadly and they, they will just run the middle of the table if you can't if you can't answer them uh by just by themselves and then the terminator sorcerers 
I think, as we've talked about before, are kind of sweet just like by themselves. Um, they have a little minus one damage thing that they do when they're in a unit, but we're just, we're just not using that today. I think they can do it for themselves, but it's kind of doesn't, uh, it doesn't really make a huge difference. Yeah, it's their putrescent vitality. Gives the minus one to be damaged in the fight phase, but most of the time I think that you're just dying in the fight phase anyway. Their defensive stat line's not that amazing. Um, but they get their once per game, uh, plus two strength and damage. So their Curse of the Leper goes to strength eight, three damage. 2d6 shots on threes. So you're just like, and then you could be reducing enemy toughness too. So they can hit toughness nine on fours or wound toughness nine on fours. So for 70 points, you get a little dude who gives deep strike and you're already not taking too many characters. So they sass the fact that they give up assassination is not that big of a deal, right? And you're like, okay, who cares? Um, if my opponent draws it and my sorcerer is doing his thing, then he'll score five points. Um, but you're not going to choose assassination, which is a consideration if you take a lot of these little characters, but only two is fine. Um, they can deep strike into an annoying spot and then they can absolutely vaporize someone with the, with the curse of the leper and then, and, and also like do actions and score positional secondaries. So for 70 points, they're just like this, a little, this like little tiny nuclear missile that you're going to blow somebody up with, which is super sick. Uh, two units of cultists, add some chaff, three predator destructors. I think I talked about these guys on the Monday video, but they, they're like only strength nine AP one, right? But they're high damage and high volume. And it's like the castigator shot, but the castigator, um, has to, uh, the castigator's twin linked and these guys aren't twin linked, but you can reduce enemy toughness values, which already helps. Plus, you can reduce their armor save if you choose that as their um, contagion. Plus, I believe that you can also, if you have a, a, a Death Guard unit in contagion range, you can give them ignore cover with boil blight. So they you get around all of the weaknesses of the Predator Destructor, essentially. They're still maybe wounding you on fives if you're like a land raider, but they can wound T10 on fours or better they go to effectively ap3 if you consider ignore cover being plus one ap which it basically is so like you just get destroyed you just die uh for 130 points that's the other thing is like they're basically free which is kind of sick i love the death guard like gun line style it's really cool uh we have a bunch of fetid bloat drones so we can get that the those contagion effects out on the enemy uh, because they are just running out there. Two Plague Burst Crawlers for artillery, and then a bunch of Nurglings, and a bunch of Wardog Carnivores. So basically, like, the list is all guns, and kind of the opposite of playing the Plague Marine list, where you are taking Wardog Brigands to act as your backline shooting, and then following that up with Plague Marines. We're basically doing the opposite here, where we're taking Carnivores to be our melee, like, forward presence, and then using the Death Guard stuff as the shooting uh like battery which is really cool and probably more points efficient because the carnivores are much less expensive than the um than the brigands and you get much longer range out of them out of the destructors than you do the brigands too this list is very cool <laughs> i like this list a lot man alpine cup had some really spicy lists this is very sweet It certainly, yeah, it certainly sounds like a thing, Google Map. Um, uh, all right, what else are we looking for? Drakari and stuff. What time we got? Five forty-six. Hot damn. We, we've been we've been cranking it today. Woo! Let's go. Uh, all right, let's talk about this assimilation swarm list that everyone everyone's bugging me about. Is it scorched earth? Did um? Did tabletop live stream stream this list? If so, then. Great. There you go. Scorched Earth. Is it this one? I imagine so. Ooh, spicy. Assimilating time. Uh, all right. Cool beans. So 
we've got a Broodlord with instinctive defense. So they get fights first while within six of a Nissimilator. So you can play the um, the scout unit much more aggressively than you normally could because if enemies come into you, you probably just kill them with the gene stealers. Uh, we have a narrow time with Biophagic Flow, so he's got the extended range on regenerating people, plus a Turvagon. Cool. Uh, Turvagon with a big brick of 20 Termagants. So we can heal both of them, I guess, right, with the Assimilators. And healing a Turvagon is kind of a big deal because those guys are a bitch to kill. 10 Gene Sailors for the Broodlord to attach into. One Horospex, one Malice Scepter. Double Psychophages. <laughs> the Psychophages. I mean, I guess... Do we have Venom Thropes? We do. So we have the full kind of like, um, the full uh, like defensive combo on the Termagants, right? They've they've got minus one to be hit with the Venom Thropes, um, plus the six up feel no pain from the Psychophage. So killing all 20 of them is really hard. And then you get regeneration both from the Turbagon and from the Assimilators as well. So you can actually regenerate a ton of Termagants back into this unit if you don't one shot it. Uh, and that's kind of rad. Three Ripper Swarms, because they're assimilators, so they can just uh, sit there on objectives and generate you free healing. A Sporocyst. Is the Sporocyst also an assimilator? That would give it a reason to do anything. Mm, no, it's just a guy. I'll be honest, I don't know what the Sporocyst is doing. <laughs> That's nuts. I guess, like, it makes mines. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what, this, what this is here for. That one I can't, I can't talk about. It is a Sporosis chat. Yeah, I have no idea. I wish I could provide insight into the, the reason for this Sporosis to be here, but I guess it's just there. Um, they like screens, I guess. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. They don't even infiltrate. <laughs> it just sits in your deployment zone and makes mucolid spores. I guess that's what we're doing. We're making mucolid spores. Wild. Absolutely wild. And I guess you can heal it. Like it's like T10 and has 10 wounds and you can heal it if it doesn't die. It free overwatches, yeah. Can we look at Annihilation Legion? Sure. That'll be our last one. We'll look at the Annihilation Legion. The mine dying can be used to heal units. Ah. That is that is high level technology, chat. Yeah, so that's if you If you if the you could use reclaim biomass when the mine detonates itself to regenerate someone to like pass a regeneration. All right, that's really cool. Is that the that's the <laughs> That's the idea? I'm I'm kind of into it. All right, all right, I'll buy that. I didn't even think about that, but that's really cool. You'd be like, oh, you're not gonna kill my thing to get me to heal? I'll do it myself. You also get to use it twice per round, right? Assuming you have enough CP for it. Cause you can, um... 
you can um, do it on your turn and your opponent's turn. I assume. I don't think there's a like a phase restriction on that, right? Yeah, it's just any phase. That's wild. Is that not... I guess it's... It's, uh... Would you not just take a Biovore from that, right? Because then it's like it's like 75 points less expensive. Or 70 points cheaper. Because there's not already a Biovore, right? So we're not... We're not using the bio... We're not using both of them in tandem. Yeah, and we have a Tyrant Guard for the Nero Tyrant. The Tyrant Guard, uh, I mean, Tyrant Guard, I made a whole video about how good Tyrant Guard were in Assimilation Swarm. I think the thing I like to do with them is is give them um, the plus one strength bonus. The fuck is that called? Parasitic Biomorphology. Because then if you, if you ever kill someone, the unit goes, like, absolutely insane. And plus one strength is really good for the Hive Tyrant himself, because his weapons are all, like, wildly low strength for no reason. Um... But just the unit having like being like T8 with a million wounds and a three plus save, it's very hard to kill them all. And then you get to heal a bunch of them back every turn. And it's just like a lot of high toughness stuff to heal back. Because you're basically like automatically gaining three, um, three wounds back from each of each heal trigger that that hits them. Um. The mucolids. Yeah, the mucolids can detonate when enemies move within three or within if they move within three of an enemy. So you can you can all you can like you have total control if your opponent's like near you. Um over when you trigger your reclaim biomass. And they also automatically hit for D3 mortal wounds instead of just one like the regular spore mine. That's cool. That's really that's like yeah, that's some that's some really cool technology I had never even considered. I like that chat. That's thinking with your head. Sick list. Ah, the list this week have been amazing. I love it. I love it. All right, what are we talking about? Annihilation Legion from Perils of the Geekery. This one had our only undefeated Adeptus Custodes from the weekend, which is kind of surprising. Um, is it this one? No. Is it this one? Yeah. All right. I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna level with you, chat. I have no idea what Annihilation Legion does, so I apologize. I'm gonna go I'm gonna go click on it real quick so I can remember. <laughs> you get reroll charge rolls. If your target is below half strength, you get plus one to charge. So you go fast, but it's only for destroyer cult and flayed ones. Uh, we have a Nightbringer, two Hexmark destroyers, which are destroyer cult. Um. Which can actually like let you charge out a deep strike more easily, which is kind of cute. Uh, a Scorpic Lord with ingrained superiority, so he is um, plus one AP on critical wounds for his unit. Another Scorpic Lord plus a Technomancer. We have a big unit of Canoptic Wraiths for the Technomancer to chill with. I don't know if we have any synergy with them. No, every single detachment, every single stratagem is destroyed. Destroy our Cutter Flayed ones keyworded so. They're just chill. They're just a good unit. Turns out, Canoptic Wraith's good enough to take with no detachment abilities. Um, we've got two units of five flayed ones. So we can make any of that stuff minus one to be hit. Uh, we can give them all plus one to hit and situationally plus one to wound if you target something below half strength. You can reactively reanimate when you destroy a unit or bring them below half. And you can blood surge to people. 
Um, yeah, that's the big stuff. And you can you can use the plus one to hit stratagem on shooting attacks too. So the heavy destroyers can be hitting on twos potentially. Uh, two x six scorpion destroyers to go into the with the uh, scorpion lords, a tomb blade unit, and two units of ophidians. The ophidians get a little uppy downy, and they get plus potentially plus one to charge out of deep strike. So that definitely helps quite a bit. I don't know what else the Scorpec Lords give the um, Scorpec Destroyers. This is so funny. This is like units I've never <laughs> interacted with <laughs> in this whole edition. I have no idea what they do. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, I, just, I couldn't find the Scorpec Lord. Scorpec Lord, what do you do? Ooh, they get a uh, they get the Hellbrex uh, impact attack. Oh, it's within engagement range of him though. No, nah, it's stupid. No, they have a bad impact attack, and they give you lethal hits. All right, boring, boring. Um, they get hit rerolls, and they have lethal hits from the Scorpec Lord. And once per game, devastating wounds. A little bit of anti-synergy there, but it is what it is. All right, once per game per... So twice per game for a unit of six. That's kind of cool. I get two plasma sites. I like that. I'm glad the plasma site's not like an untargetable unit anymore. That was really annoying. Oh, he is an Enmitic Annihilator, but not an Exterminator. So it's not as good as the Heavy Destroyer's gun. All right. Well, I don't know if I have I can uh, put too much... <laughs> too, <laughs> too much uh, insight into this list. This is a bunch of wild stuff. It's a great title, though. <laughs> I'm going to charge you. If that works, then this list works. <laughs> been sad about Scorpec Lords since they debuted. Yeah, they've always been like like you want a real like when they when they were first re announced, right? When they were first revealed, you're like, "Oh, cool. Necrons finally have like a legitimate smash character, like a big a big dude who's going to have like some sick melee attacks and he's going to blow up a tank with his sword." And then they came out and they were just like, I'm just a guy. I'm like, I'm like medium strength or whatever. And you're like, why? I don't get it. He's just like, I give you lethal hits and sometimes I do mortal wounds. And you're like, okay, well, that's cute, I guess. Um, I mean, he's not bad. He's 100 points, which is like way too expensive. You think this guy's better? You think this profile's better than a Space Marine Captain? Like, are you kidding me? Like, I guess he's strength 10 and 3 damage instead of strength 8, 2 damage, but he doesn't have finest hour <laughs> and rights of battle like you put those two those two profiles next to each other and you're like wow one of these is definitely 30 points less expensive than the other one he doesn't have like a really bizarre rapid fire weapon um yeah i don't know he's just been weird but they, they're so afraid of giving Necrons good melee characters. I, I've never understood it. Outside of the Catan shards, none of their characters are like can hold a candle to like any right, right, like random space marine in melee. Which is just so weird, because they're so much more expensive and they're so much bigger. I don't get it, chat. Yeah, Ophidian Destroyers are actually, they're like unironically legit. They're just a good utility unit. And if you if you give them bonuses to charge, like they'll they'll just like clear objectives for you just fine. Um, 
They they're like little raveners. They have the same rule. It they just end of your opponent's turn. They 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 go into reserve and then they deep strike back on. Then it's nice. They've also got five attacks and can get devastating wounds. Like that's actually kind of sick, right? That's it's like a it's like a good profile <laughs> right there, right? For whatever it is, 30, 30 points a model. I guess they die immediately. They're probably too expensive. They're almost literally just a Ravener. They're two damage instead of twin links. Uh, and they have the same defensive profile. They're OCT, I guess. That's a big deal. OC2 is kind of big. So. But they're a lot more expensive for kind of no reason. Um, but yeah, I don't know. These guys seem great. Scorpion Lord should be a shield captain if it were fluffy. I mean, maybe. I don't know if he needs to be that like that powerful, but definitely better than like four attacks. It's just so sad. Cool list though. I don't know. Cool to see melee Necrons getting some work done. I don't have much else to say about that though. I think with that chat, we'll probably uh, wrap things up there. Wrap things up on the highlight of Annihilation Legion. Um, please come hang out with me this weekend. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be spending so long traveling out down to Florida. So please come watch the ETC live stream. Uh, I will this uh, this stream will redirect over to that one before uh, when I hop off. So I uh, hope you all come watch the show. It's gonna be a good a good time i think i assume uh, i'm gonna get to i got some new uh new equipment for it so hopefully the we will spruce up the look of the stream a little bit as well um but yeah i'm leaving on thursday for that so uh, i have some content that should be scheduled for the rest of the week but it depends on whether i can get it done between tonight and tomorrow um so it may be a little quiet this week before i come back next week but uh such is the way of uh traveling to stream every weekend so Big thanks to everybody who's uh, supporting over uh, either with the channel membership or the, the folks who super chatted today. I really appreciate that. Uh, and the folks who support during the live streams. Obviously, it is an expensive process to go uh, to, to jump down to these events. And uh, I really appreciate everybody who, uh, who can help me out um, get out there. But yeah, otherwise, uh, I did have a game scheduled this evening, but that one got canceled. So we are uh, just going to be live tomorrow morning over on the Purple Channel. So I'm going to be live at 9.30 a.m. U.S. Eastern. So that is uh, like 15 hours from now, I think, is how the math works out. Um, and that is going to be uh, Necrons versus uh, Mimi Salamander's Battle Company. So it's the list I talked about on my video last week, um, and it should be a fun game. I... I think that specifically, like, uh, Canoptic Court Necrons is, like, a really, really bad matchup. Uh, so it's unfortunate that we got it round two, but it is what it is. <laughs> um, maybe we can fight our way out. I don't know. I don't think so. Turns out the one thing that Meltas don't want to see is, like, tons and tons of wraiths. Uh, I can definitely kill most of the other stuff. and I can kill Catan Shards all day, and I can kill monoliths anytime i want but i can't kill tons and tons of wraiths so we'll see if i get run, run over also wraiths are pretty good at killing tactical marines so that's not great either <laughs> but uh it, at least at very least it'll be a fun game and we'll see how it goes um otherwise i'm gonna go ahead and wrap things up there thanks everyone for hanging out with me uh i'll see you this weekend and maybe tomorrow and where we keep it classy have happy wargaming all that stuff and uh, have a good week